our distinguished lecture series for the SSI. So we hope you've enjoyed it. If you, this is your first, then welcome. Um, today we're happy to have Dr. Bill Press. He is the Warren J. and Viola M. Raymer Chair in Computer Science and Integrated Biology at the University of Texas. His research is on bioinformatics, especially whole genome studies and computational statistical methods. Prior to June 2004, Press served as, for five years as Deputy Laboratory Director at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Before that, he was for 20 years Professor of Astronomy and Physics at Harvard University. In April 2009, President Obama named Press as a member of his President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Press has been elected to the National Academy of Sciences and to the Council on Foreign Relations. So we're clearly lucky to have him here today, and with that, I'll turn it over. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is the microphone on? I'm good. Okay, let's make this work. And so I want to tell you today about bandit problems. Um, which is something that have been around for oh, a long time, 20 years or m probably more, 30 years, um, and a kind of a novel application in clinical trials and um, a sort of a framing of what I call computational ethics. Uh, and you'll see what I mean by that. And um, this is not originally designed as a lunchtime talk, so it's sort of bristling with some equations and I don't want them to spoil your digestion. So, <laughs> so we'll sort of quickly just sort of say what's going on in them and not try to, to do any detailed derivation of them here. Um, so to set up what is a bandit problem, let's imagine that we're going to play a game and the game is like you've got a checker and you're going to move it on a checkerboard or on a lattice, except this is a four-dimensional lattice, which is to say its coordinates are a quadruple of numbers, uh, as you see some values here. Um, and here I've tried to show not just the two axes, but two more axes that I can't easily draw on the slide, but it's, the, it's a positive four-dimensional lattice. And the way we play the game is we start at the origin at 0, 0, 0, 0 with our marker, with our checker. Um, and our opponent is nature. Um, and nature gets to do only uh, one uh, choice of strategy. Nature gets to pick success probabilities A and B that are going to correspond to some choices of ours that we have in a minute. So nature fixes those success probabilities uh, once and for all. And now what we get to do is for each move, we get to play either capital A, which I'm going to show in the picture as blue, or uh, capital B, which we, I'll show in the picture as red. Now, our strategy can be a bit more complicated than nature's. Our strategy can be we could have an absolute strategy so that at any point in the lattice, you'll see how we move around the lattice in a second, at any point in the lattice, the strategy is pick red or pick blue. Or it could be a probabilistic strategy where every point in the lattice is labeled by probability of our picking red versus blue. This will get, I hope, a little bit clearer as you see. And if we pick blue, which is A, then nature rolls the die using probability little a and tells us whether we are win or lose. And if we pick B, nature rolls the die with, and tells us with probability B whether we win or lose, succeed or fail. And then, just to keep track of where we are in the game, we move our marker exactly one step. And this shows the possible ways to move it. Um, and what the marker keeps track of is the number of successes of A, the number of failures of A, the number of successes of B, and the number of failures of B. So nature actually doesn't care about this lattice. This is just our accounting scheme of knowing the whole past history, or rather not the past history, but the accumulated successes that we've seen or not seen. And so the four possible moves are if we chose strategy B and it succeeded, we would add one to the third position. If we chose strategy B and it failed, we would add one to the fourth position. St and likewise, strategy A, either it succeeds, in which case we add to the first position, or it fails, in which we add one to the second position. Okay. So the marker just keeps track, I think I just said that, of the successes and failures of A and B. And we stop at what's called the horizon. The horizon is when the total number of moves, successes plus failures of A plus B is some 
predetermined number, you know, like 100. But you'll see later we're going to be interested in like a million. Um, um, and that, of course, in this four-dimensional lattice is some kind of diagonal hyperplane, right? So when we reach the diagonal hyperplane, we stop and the game is over and we see how well we've done. Um, so as I've said, a complete strategy for us is to label the lattice by our probabilities R for making the move A or B. Um, and if we knew the complete strategy, that'll never change because any other game in, in an identical game, if we go through the same point on the graph, we're just in exactly the same situation. So, and the question is, what strategy maximizes our expected total success without knowing the values of little a and little b in advance? It's obvious that if we knew the values in advance, we'd just say whichever, pick whichever one is bigger and play that one all the time, either red all the time or blue all the time. Okay, um, so these are called banded games. Um, and they're named after some uh, metaphorical use of the term one-armed bandit, meaning a slot machine. But these are two-armed bandits. And my picture, I can't see it very well on the screen. You can actually see the two arms on this slot machine corresponding to choosing strategy A or choosing strategy B. I suspect that this is actually a picture of a row of slot machines and that one of those arms is the arm on the next slot machine over. But that's OK. It works for our purposes here. Um, and banded games, uh, by that name, have been around, I think, 20 or 30 years. And the concept has been around for probably half a century. Now, what I really want to talk about is uh, how to think about adaptive clinical trials. And if you think about it, you'll see that this is a perfect setup for a somewhat idealized view of a clinical trial. In a clinical trial, we have two possible treatments or interventions. Uh, or we might have one treatment and a placebo, or we might have one new treatment and an existing standard of care. But for my purposes here, there are going to be two possible things that we can do with, with a patient, two possible uh, treatments that we can assign a patient to. And R, our strategy, is how we assign patients in this trial based on successes or failures uh, of how each treatment is done thus far. Okay. And so the unknown probabilities, little a and little b, um, are the cure rates, if you will, of the um, two medical interventions. Now, I have to say, this is not how adaptive clinical trials are done today. Uh, many statisticians over the last uh, decade or more have suggested that something like this is the way um, clinical trials should be done, namely something adaptive. Um, but it's already a struggle between the statistical world and the medical world to convince people to do adaptive clinical trials in any form, as opposed to um, fixed, fixed predetermined, random, random uh, equal samples, which is the way it's done now. Um, that's, that's a whole riff I could, I could go into, and you'd see smoke coming out of my ears. But I'll, I'll, I don't have time to do that today. Um, so banded models. Um, as it, it, it's widely summarized, capture the trade-off between the cost of gathering information and the benefit of using it. Um, or as some call it, the exploration versus exploitation dilemma. Right? Because um, if you don't explore both arms for a while, then you don't really know with any statistical significance which treatment is better. But if you then continue to explore both arms, then you're depriving patients of the better treatment. Well, how sure do you have to be? You know, what's the right way to optimize that? That's basically the, the subject of this talk. Um, and we want to minimize, in some ethical way, um, patients assigned to a treatment already known, suspected, guessed to be inferior. And that's sort of where, where the the whole issue is. Um, now, I'll pass very quickly over the fact that this model is an idealization of what's really a more complicated situation in, in the medical research world. Um, we assume that previous outcomes are known before each assignment. That's not true. We assume that, that success is a one-bit success or failure. That's not true. There could be side effects on, on one treatment. There could be different success rates for patients of different <laughs> genomic types, although I'll come back to that one. Uh, but uh, although I won't have time today, there are generalizations of what I'm going to tell you today um, to more realistic cases. So let's proceed with, with this 
highly ide idealized thing. Okay, don't let it spoil your lunch. Um, the purpose of this equation is to point out that just in the framing of the problem, we've already made an ethical choice. Our ethical choice is that we're going to uh, try to optimize a total cost, which is an expectation over indiv individual patients. Okay? In other words, it's a cost function for each patient times the probability of assigning that patient to that treatment, uh, where I could explain what all the notation is, but either you'll figure it out or it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, and why do I say that this is an ethical choice? Because this is a very specifically utilitarian metric. Um, this is a picture of Jeremy Bentham, who is actually stuffed in University College London. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. He willed his fortune to University College London, this is in the 18th century, on condition that they send him to a taxidermist and wheel him out on display annually. And, and they do. I've never witnessed that, but, I've <laughs> but I never was there on the right day of the year, but, but I have visited um, UCL. Uh, anyway, uh, he's, he is the origin of, of, of this nice phrase in English, the greatest good for the greatest number. And, and we, we're going to make that choice. But even within this utilitarian framework, we get to decide, both mathematically and ethically, what this should be. How, given the state of play of the game, and given the two possibilities of assigning each patient, how should we cost that? Uh, then we'll somehow turn the crank, and I'll, and I'll show you how, and figure out what the optimal strategy is. Okay, now this actually sounds like it's a very hard problem because we've got this huge four-dimensional lattice. Uh, we're trying to find a globally optimal strategy R. Um, and you would think that the strategy at every point depends on the strategy at every other point, if you think about it, because, be, because you know, later points depend on where you went through points earlier and so on. It's, it sounds like a very nonlinear, very computationally difficult problem. Um, and um, rather amazingly, and this has been known for at least 20 years, there's an exact backward recurrence on that lattice. That's sort of why I showed you that lattice. To solve this problem for basically a general choice of this patient-specific cost function. And without trying to, to uh, you know, go, go through that term by term, I'll tell you the idea. The idea is you start on the horizon it's, it's a backtracking algorithm, or if you know what dynamic programming is, it's a dynamic programming algorithm. You basically start on the horizon and say, what's my cost to getting to the horizon? Well, it's zero because I'm already there. Then you back off to all the possible places you can be one before the horizon. And you can say, if I'm here, then what's my average cost of getting to the horizon? And that is just computing the expectation of one step, so you can do it. And now if you think about it, you can just back your way down the lattice labeling it. Um, and this is basically the recursion relation that labels the whole lattice to give you the optimal strategy. Okay? So this sounds great. However, we're going to see it's not really great because the lattice is so big. The lattice is four-dimensional. And although 100 by 100 by 100 by 100 is only 10 to the 8th, and that's a labeling that one could do on a desktop computer, a million by million by million by million um, is 10 to the 24, which is much too big to, you know, to even imagine doing on any um, present or future computer. And so we're going to have to find another way, not a backward recurrent strategy for doing this. Um, the other thing that comes out of this equation um, is kind of interesting. Um, if you look at how the R, the probability of choosing red or blue, enters the recursion relation. It turns out, and, and it's not a surprise if you sort of think about it, it had to, because we're doing an expectation. Um, it enters linearly, either as an R or as a 1 minus R. Um, well, what that means is that at each stage of the game, if you do the optimization over R, because it's linear, the, it'll get pinned either at its maximum value or its minimum value. There can't be an optimum in between 0 and 1. So that actually shows this rather, to me, non-obvious fact that the optimal strategy is deterministic. That even though we allowed for a probabilistic strategy of assigning patients, 
We, don't ha we, we will never be required to do that. There will be an, at least an optimal strategy, as good as any other optimal strategy, that is deterministic. That says that given the state of play, the strategy should, will just tell you definitively, do I choose red or do I choose blue? Um, Okay, so now let's talk about sort of the computational ethics because this is this question of how to choose a cost function. Now, uh, if this were an economics problem, the economists wouldn't have any doubt at all how to choose a cost function. It would be net present value, okay? It would be basically add up the cost in dollars but don't, add, but don't count distant future dollars the same as you count present dollars and discount the future exponentially by the, you know, the time, time of money equation, compound interest equation basically. Um, but when we're dealing with clinical trials, you know, you can't discount patients exponentially to the future. Um, in fact, if anything, a Present pa a, a, a pa present patient sh probably could be discounted more than a future patient. The opposite of economics. Why? Because the present patient may have consented to enroll in a clinical trial, whereas the future patient will be a member of the population at large who has not consented to the fact that you've decided to tell them to take uh, ibuprofen, you know, instead of aspirin for a headache or more seriously, you know, one, one version of chemotherapy versus another for a cancer. Um, so we want to impose some, some ethical principles that t will turn out to constrain what this cost function can be. Um, the first principle, and I'm basi basically some of these are in the literature and some of these I'm, I'm going to just assert and if you share my ethics, you'll agree with me, and if you don't, we can have an interesting discussion, okay? Um, but I think you'll see these are very reasonable things. Um, um, a principle that I'll call here equality, um, that the cost that we assign to a patient shouldn't de depend explicitly on where they are in the study. Um, now, it will depend implicitly on that through the strategy, but we should never say, because your patient number is, an, is a prime number, we're always going to assign you to the red study. Okay, that would be an example of an explicit dependence on M. And we're going to say that shouldn't happen. And so that says that the cost function has to have this form instead of this more general form. Um, okay, here's a principle that we could call outcomes. And that says that the cost function should be an expectation over the outcomes for that patient. Um, it should not just be, depend ad hoc on the assignment. Okay? Um, so what would be an example of something that violates outcomes? It would be a cost function that says, well, since we've assigned you to the treatment of one of our corporate sponsors, we're going to cost any failures less than we would otherwise. Okay, now that would be a fairly gross example, but you see the idea. It wouldn't be that there is a criteria that will just do its expectation for you and that that will be the cost. It would be that, that some other uh, um, side information would enter the assignment, which we might, might consider not ethical, and so we'll require this principle. This turns out to be very powerful because this turns out to imply that uh, b b because basically the the cost has to be r times something because that's one outcome and one minus r because that's one probable choice and one minus r times something else that if you rewrite it as sort of even and odd parts in r you find that there's an even part that doesn't contain the strategy um, s is sort of just a reparameterization of r s stands for strategy there's an even part that doesn't contain the strategy at all, and then there's an odd part where the strategy all resides. And I'll show you in a minute that that leads to some sort of surprising or at least non-obvious non conclusions. Okay, now if both of these hold, in fact, I'll tell you right now, if both of these hold, you can do a little playing around with the recurrence equation, and you can conclude that the total cost only depends on the strategy through, I think I just said this, through the odd piece. Okay? And that therefore, any two strategies that have the same even piece are actually equivalent, even if they don't sound equivalent. Um, 
I think I already said this, that we can't exponentially discount the future. And that's what makes this problem interesting mathematically if we want the horizon to get very large. Because, because we don't have a, yet a good way of taking that limit of the total number of patients going to infinity, or rather to the total size of the population, not just to 50 or 100 people in a clinical trial. So here are examples of cost functions that, that satisfy those criteria. Um, and these are standard ones that, that, that are used in, in clinical trials or proposed for uh, adaptive clinical trials. Um, expected failures, which is called EF. Okay, So A is the cure rate. And so if with probability R we choose A, then R times 1 minus A are the number of failures of A due to A. And 1 minus R times 1 minus B is the number of failures due to B. So uh, rewriting this in terms of this S, which is just this reparameterization of, of R. Remember what R is? It's the probability with which we choose A rather than B. Uh, um, you find this. And you can see this is an even part. This only depends on A plus B. And this is an odd part. It depends on A minus B or, or B minus A. Now, in the literature, I think not in a very sophisticated part of the literature. In the literature, you find people criticizing expected failures and proposing instead a more sophisticated metric, which is expected successes lost. And the idea is just, what if there isn't a good treatment for this disease? What if A and B are both kind of bad? Okay, Then you're costing them for things that are sort of beyond their control. In expected failures, you're costing them for the failures that either one of them would have had. And shouldn't you instead cost expected successes lost? And that's defined with this cases inequality. Um, it basically says, if A is the better treatment than B, then you'll cost only when you choose B how much better A would have been. Okay? And if A is less than B, so B is the better treatment, then it's symmetric the other way around. If B is the better treatment, then only when you choose A, with probability R, will there be a cost, and that cost will be the difference, the success is lost from having assigned the patient to B instead of A. Now, you know, this looks like it has some logic with an if statement in it, but if you play around, you know how this works, that when you have ifs on greater than or less than, you can usually find a way of writing them in terms of absolute values. Um, and it turns out that this is just exactly this. And lo and behold, the odd pieces are the same. And if something is an optimal strategy for expected failures, it is also an optimal strategy, therefore, for expected successes lost. Um, a point that seems to have been lost on some of the people who criticized the use of, of this as a, as, as a metric. So, so there's, you know, you can see where, as we, when we view it in this light, we can see some non-obvious things. Okay, so why not solve this problem exactly? I mean, are we there yet? I've, I've told you how to frame the problem. I've told you that there's this backward recurrence re solution. Why don't we just get going and use it? So the good news is it's a simple algorithm, and it's a pretty universal solution to the ethics. I mean, you can write down other principles, and almost all reasonable things you write down will sort of collapse um, to something equivalent to either expected failures or expected successes lost. Um, but the bad news. Uh, I've mentioned is that the time and space scale as the, the computational time and space scales the size of the lattice uh, as m to the fourth. Um, so on a desktop, maybe only 300 is accessible. On, on my particular desktop with Windows XP and whatever my memory size is, I can actually get to 294 and then I crash the machine. Okay, well, on a serious supercomputer, you could probably do up to m a few thousand, um, but a non-trivial calculation. And we may want answers for a million. We might want answers for what is the best assignment to a disease that has a million cases a year? You know, different flu vaccine, different flu medicines, um, um, 
uh, you know, diseases of large incident. And so the question I now want to turn to, which is where I start getting into something that I contributed to this problem, is how do we look at huge solutions in four dimensions here? How do we say anything sensible about the case 10 to the 6 when we know there's an exact solution and we know that it's computationally inaccessible? Okay, well, the right way to do this is probably would be to maybe to prove, for some people, would be to prove theorems about it. But I tend to be a more of a computer scientist and more of an experimental computer scientist. So I'm going to show you a somewhat experimental approach. Um, and related to this question of what's the solution for 10 to the 6 is the sort of more qu qualitative question, what is the solution's topology? And by that I mean, suppose we had the solution for 10 to the 6, and we just went to some point in the middle of the lattice and looked around, and we'd see kind of red and blue dots telling us whether we're supposed to assign treatment A or treatment B. Would we find them like all finely intermixed in some, you know, strange looking, delicately computed pattern? Or would we find like big blocks of red so that, you know, if your past results are anything like this, then you'll always be assigning red over here, and you'll always assi be assigning red blue over here. And then maybe only right where there's a crossover do you get some fine, intricate thing. I don't know. That's actually sort of what I expected, you know, that there would be maybe all of the above. There'd be big regions of red and blue, and then regions where you can't quite decide, and so it's doing some kind of random sampling mixture thing. Um, Okay, so um, what do you do when you're trying to explore four dimensions? Well, you just sort of start trying to pick two of them at a time and plotting them and, and, and trying to understand what the solutions look like in the accessible region, in the region up to 294 on my, on my computer. Um, so I won't take the time to tell you how I got here, but if you stare at these, at these things, th they ought to have a familiar look. Like this is T and it, shouldn't, it, it, it ought to look a, bit, a little bit like a T value comparing two means, right? Um, and this, you know, is, um, th remember these are numbers of cases. So this is some kind of sample size imbalance on how many times did I try A and how many times did I try B. And if I pick these two variables and graph the exact solution um, for some particular horizon size, so this is a horizon size of 100. I didn't want to stress my computer for this one. And this is what your choices look like um, when you're the 50th patient, okay, in terms of these two variables. And you can see that it's pretty much all blue here and all red here. And then right up here, you just see some little wedges where it looks a little bit intermixed. OK? Now, the hard problem of sort of diagnosis is, is this intermixed because it's really intermixed? Or is this intermixed because I'm looking at it from just the wrong angle? I'm projecting four dimensions down to two. Okay, and if there's a sharp edge, but I'm a little bit off in angle, then I'll see red dots and blue dots overlapping. Um, and I wish I had time to tell you, there's a sort of a clever statistical way to process the whole four-dimensional lattice and get at that question. In other words, there's a topology statistic to basically tell you um, um, how sharp are the edges. And that statistic told me that the edges actually were very sharp and that this is a projection effect. And that motivated me, um, I think I've said these things, that motivated me to sort of play around with these weird variables even more. And at this point, all I can tell you is, I'm just playing around, but I'm motivated by the fact that I know um, that there is a sharp boundary. The question is, can I capture it in any heuristically useful way? Um, so here's another transformation of variables, and here's what the picture has become now. And it's not perfect. There are still, there's about a dozen red dots over here, and it's symmetric, a dozen blue dots over here. Okay. But it's pretty darn good. Um, and basically, look at what this is telling us about strategy. Let's see, maybe I'll bring that in. Okay. This is saying that to decide whether to assign the patient to blue or red, you need to know two things. 
you need to know how superior is blue or red measured by something like a slightly warped T value. And then you need to know how extreme has my sampling been so far, either to blue excess or red excess so far. And the basic idea is you choose the better strategy based on T value, except that if that better strategy, if, if the other strategy is way undersampled, then you choose the other strategy, and that's the exploitation, right, the exploration versus exploitation dilemma. And it's almost perfectly ca uh, captured by this green line, which is actually just this heuristic right here. Okay? So, so this is, uh, and I, the other thing I've shown you is here, the picture is only for one value of the horizon. You try this for different horizon sizes, and you discover that empirically the scaling with horizon is very, very close to this, this funny combination of logs. In fact, fantastically, fantastically close. Okay, if you do this heuristic in the, ex in the accessible region and compare it with the exact answer, you actually get the right answer 99.51% of the time at a horizon of 60, and this slowly rises as the horizon rises. And here, I'm at the mercy of numerical experiment. I don't know a theorem, um, but um, chances are very good that this simply continues rising and that, and that this becomes asymptotically good as the horizon, asymptotically perfect as the horizon size goes to infinity. The numerical evidence is certainly all indicating that. So let me show you some numbers on how well this does. Uh, and here I'm going to use that fancy metric expected successes lost. And let's just start at, at the, it, let's just look at the first column because that's the game I told you where I start at the origin. I start knowing nothing about the two treatments and the only information I'm going to have comes from playing this game. Um, and in the exact case, by the time I've treated 100 patients, if I do the exactly optimal strategy, I will have killed 1.74 of them. Now I'm saying kill just to be dramatic. We might be just checking headache remedies, and, and the only difference is that they had their headache for an extra hour. Um, but let's, let's be dramatic here. Okay. Um, and the heuristic strategy, I just told you I would have killed 1.76. So it's definitely not optimal, but it's not too bad. Now, if you want a shocker, the standard clinical trial with 100 patients would be this line. It would have divided the patients into 50 in each group and assigned 50 patients to A and 50 patients to B, and it would have killed 16.6 of them. Okay? Because all 50 patients in the inferior treatment would have been given the inferior treatment no matter what the results coming in were on previous patients. And this is some kind of Bayesian average over what the values of little a and little b, b are. Okay? So the first point is the point that, that the statistics community has made for a decade or more, dec probably almost two decades, and that is the world really ought to be doing adaptive clinical trials in one form or another and not um, uh, equal sample size um, random, random clinical trials. Okay. Um, and then the second point is don't be put off b by anybody who says to you, oh, we could never do that because the computations are too hard to know which treatment to assign. Because I've showed you an idealized case, but in general, I believe you can always find very good heuristics for these things um, that really make it very straightforward to decide how you would do the adaptive uh, game. Um, let me make, uh, uh, I'll explain one more line. Uh, oh, and here you see this is for the horizon size 200. So you can see we've also killed an extra 0.05 person. Uh, let's see, we killed 0.02 people here by not using the exact, only using the heuristic, and then going from 100 to 200, we killed another 0.03 people. Uh, I don't feel too bad about that, especially if it's headache remedies instead of chemotherapy. Um, there's a big literature on a strategy called play the winner, including papers by some very famous people. I won't embarrass you by telling you their names, but, but the, you know, these are pillars of the statistics community. 
Um, and what is play the winner? Play the winner says assign red. If the patient is cured, assign red again. And so on. If the patient is not cured, then switch and assign blue. Okay? It just, it just says whichever the last thing did, okay, there's, there's a beautiful literature that proves theorems about play the winner. Okay, and asymptotic convergence and this and that and all kinds of generalizations. Okay, and when I was learning this field, because this is, as you might have guessed, a little bit outside of what I normally do. Um, when I was learning this field, I was thinking, oh wow, I just can't wait to try play the winner against the optimal strategy. I bet it's pretty good. And it's awful. I mean, it's better, it's better than, than random sample, but it's actually awful. Uh, so the only thing good about play the winner is that there are a lot of theorems proved by relatively famous people about it. But... Uh, I can't see any other merit in it. And, it's, and it has a, it's cute and easy to describe, I guess. So you've got to be a little bit careful in this field. Now, we've got to get to the infinite horizon if we want to propose something that um, I, I've, I've sort of left the introduction of this part out of the talk. We want to get out of the clinical trials realm and into a realm of comparative effectiveness. Comparative effectiveness means drugs that are already on the market. But in the future, we'll be able to have data on how well they've done, patient by patient. Okay? And so the clinical trial will never end. We want to continue gathering this data and deciding what is the optimal treatment to recommend for patients who come in with, with a given illness. And that requires letting this horizon size go to infinity. Now, if you let this go to infinity, you see it, it, it isn't good. It isn't very bad. There are only sort of logarithmic divergences, but it isn't good. And if you go back to the previous picture with the red and blue dots and say, does the green line converge to anything as we go to infinity? The answer is, yeah, it does converge, but it converges to a horizontal line. And that's actually not very interesting because that's actually the equal sample size clinical trial that I was just telling you was horrible. Why is that? Because it basically says, ignore it. Remember, this axis was t-value and this axis was imbalance. It basically says, ignore the t-value and whichever, whichever red or blue strategy is undersampled, give it to that one. And why is it doing that? Because when I took the horizon off to infinity, I, I gave it permission to do exploration forever and never get down to doing exploitation because the exploitation is all pushed off to infinity. Okay? And that's the wrong answer. And that's, by the way, why in, problems, in economics problems where bandit models arise, discounting, to the future exp discounting the future exponentially by the cost of money does work, does give a convergent answer. But it doesn't here or it doesn't give a useful answer. And, you know, this was something that I just thought about in the shower every day for weeks. I thought, you know, is this a math problem or is this an ethics problem? And I eventually concluded that it's an ethics problem. The math is clear. The math says if you don't discount the future, then you'll explore forever. Okay? So it's an ethical principle that says we don't want to explore forever. We want to give the patients a benefit at every time. Um, so I would propose to you an additional ex ethical principle. Okay? And that, that I call here, it's, it's sort of gobbledygook, past future parity. And here's how I would say it. I'd say, suppose your patient number M in this either clinical trial or comparative effectiveness study, which, and if it's a comparative effectiveness study, you're just patient number M in the world who's ever been faced with this choice of drugs. Um, well, you've benefited from information from the M minus one previous patients. Um, so maybe you ought to be obligated to benefit an equal number of future patients, but no more than that. Okay? I'm not going to require more of you than, you know, this is like each one teach one or something, you know. Some, some benefit commensurate with the number of people who have benefited you. Okay? Um, or another way of saying this is every patient is assigned as if they were the middle patient in a study with finite horizon. 
Okay, so we sort of have this this pastiche of problems, of sort of overlapping problems, where each patient sees a slightly different finite horizon. Um, and why do we do that? We do that because that's the only way to be ethical to that patient. Um, that actually makes everything converge. Okay, that says that. Uh, up here for this horizon size m, we should just put the value, uh, sorry, for the horizon size, that's m sub h. Here, we should just put the value 2m. So this becomes square root of log of 2. Before, I'm sorry, I did something wrong. I pointed to this before as if it was the horizon size. No, that's, this m is the patient number. That's always finite. It's the mh, which is the horizon size that's going to infinity. Okay. Okay, so if we take this ethical principle, we have a new horizon independent strategy. We have a convergent strategy and we can ask how well it does. And that, this is exactly the same table as before, but now I'm going to explain the one remaining line. The one remaining line is this scaled horizon as I call it. And what do we expect to see? Well, if this number were hugely bigger than these numbers, you'd say, I don't think you have a very good ethical principle going there. You might think it's ethical, but you're killing a lot of patients, okay? So the payoff is essentially that the numerical experiment shows that although the scaled horizon strategy is measurably larger than either the exact or heuristic strategies, um, it's larger by very small amounts compared with the difference to any other strategy that, that, that has been proposed. Okay, so, so I think that this is what you could actually do. I think that you could run clinical trials in this way. You need some heuristics for the more, you know, you, we need to get out from under some of these idealizations. Um, and and I've, I've discussed that in the paper uh, that publishes this a little bit. Now, I'm trying to decide, I probably don't have time to do through this, but here's a very important social issue. So I'll just tell you what's on the next couple slides, but I won't really explain them. Um, what should we do about cost? What if the better treatment costs 100 times more than the second best treatment and the difference is only slight? Should we put a cost on human life in doing the optimization? Boy, I decided that I wasn't going to touch that one. I think that policymakers actually, you know, in, have to think about that, at least in the back of their minds. But I thought that an interesting question was, how far could you get trying to, this is back to inventing cost functions. How far could you get trying to invent a cost function that did not try to put a dollar value on human life, but did try to find a strategy in part based on cost? Now that sounds contradictory, but there's actually a way to do it. And so this is, this is a cost that I would call the, um, no, I'm sorry, this is a bad one. This, this, but this has been proposed. This is the dollar cost of failures. Okay, this would say, this would say, we'll, we'll look at, um, I, I don't have time to tell you what this is, but it's bad. Okay, so here's uh, the ethical principle that I proposed to apply to this. The ethical principle says that the cost function should always favor assigning the best treatment. Okay, now in the end when you know what the best treatment is, that says that, the cost, that you'll always assign the best treatment. Um, okay, um, so here's, here's what I propose as a possible way around the price question. And that is to use as a cost function the expected dollar cost of treating lost successes. Now what does that actually mean? That means how much was spent on lost successes of the inferior treatment. In other words, if a patient got the superior treatment I'm not going to look at what the cost was. But if the patient got the inferior treatment, I am. Now, of course, I don't know that at the time the patient is given the treatment. This is all statistical expectation. But I'm optimizing a strategy, so in the end, that will be the way, the, the, the way in expectation um, it's costed. Okay. Um, and the, the sort of 
model here is the idea, um, um, I'm not anti-drug company. I think we've put the, the, the big pharma in terrible ethical situations by sort of designing for them a set of incentives that f essentially force bad behavior. But an example of bad behavior is if there's a disease out there that people are spending a lot of money on, then it's in big pharma's interest to bring out a competing drug um, probably much more expensive than any generic that might already be out there and to try to convince people that it's better than the generic but without actually amassing the statistical evidence to prove it. Okay? And I want a cost function that in the end will uh, make that uh, not an optimal strategy for, for pharma because I, because I want a, an assignment of patients that, you, you know, that, that will essentially deter that. Um, and you can work it all through. It all goes through and all it does is these green curves used to go through the origin zero zero and now they just shift a little bit. They actually shift logarithmically with the cost ratio. And what that means is you say you've got the better drug but it's really expensive then I'm going to require somewhat higher t-value of demonstration of that um, before you reach the green line and it starts getting and, and it starts getting assigned but I'll give you the chance to acquire that t-value because of this sample size inequality effect that, that there will be some things in the red okay so I sort of glossed over that but but I thought that's an interesting um, thing that you can also do with this kind of math so, so just to conclude, you know, what's the vision here of a utopian future? I think this will be in practice very hard to get to politically, but I think the fact that things are difficult to get to doesn't mean we shouldn't ha have our eyes on them, we have some vision of the future that maybe we, then we can find some practical steps for. So this utopian future, this is a picture from Thomas Hobbes' Utopia in the, um, I guess, 16th century, um, is New drugs would undergo safety testing as now. And then they should be subjected to a period of marketing only through some comparative effectiveness pool. And during that time, all outcomes will be tracked. And physicians, essentially at their option, um, would, could query the pool on behalf of individual patients and ask, what's today's best ethical recommendation for the treatment of this disease? And the oracle would come back in real time on their, you know, on their little tablet computer and it would say treatment A or treatment B or it would be more complicated you know, if we took a less idealized case. Um, but it would be something like an adaptive comparative effectiveness study. And therefore the best treatments would quickly come to predominate in the recommendations. Now, does that mean that I would say to the manufacturer, you have to take your drug off the market? It's safe. Maybe it has some effectiveness. Um, I don't think we'd have to. I think that because the comparative effectiveness pool would never be recommending the drug once it's, it's sort of shown with high confidence to be inferior. And we might require labeling on the drug saying, you know, this drug was deemed inferior by the comparative effectiveness pool <laughs> and then let them try to market it, <laughs> okay? And as I say, I don't want to incentivize them to lose money, I want to incentivize them to, to develop drugs that will win the comparative effectiveness pool and therefore get recommended all the time with zero marketing costs, which would actually be a very good thing for pharma. Uh, Okay, and then the other thing, and I won't have time to discuss this at all, is you can imagine generalizations of this that stratify on other characteristics of the patient, for example, genomic factors. So that at any given time, you're running not just one clinical trial or one comparative effectiveness trial, but sort of combinatorially many of them, you know, all uh, essentially digesting the same information and making recommendations to um, uh, exploit, explore and exploit uh, in all of those different combinatorial trials. Okay, so that's the pitch on uh, bandit problems and thank you for listening. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and this is a very fundamental question. This is the this is that. For all the bad things I said about equal sample sizes, double blind uh, uh, methodology, that is the gold standard. Um, it wasn't just coincidence that that emerged as what happens when you take the limit of the horizon size going to infinity. Okay. Now I think, and, and I'm speaking now sort of as a policy person as well as a sometimes statistician, um, I think the world's just going to have to grow up on that. Because I think we're going to have an enormous amount of data that is not double blind and not equal sample size. And we're going to have to find ways of doing more sophisticated treatments of that data with all its flaws. Because, because the amount of information in it will be huge. So, so I think your, your point is exactly right. And I think it's a, it's a societal choice here. Would we, would we rather have a conclusion which is methodologically perfect but has a sample size of 100? Or would we rather have a conclusion which has methodological flaws that we will have to be investigating and debating forever but has a sample size of a million? Um, and in my old field of astrophysics, um, it, th that field was sort of revolutionized by, it's not exactly the same revolution, but, it, but it's almost, it's by f amounts of data increasing exponentially even though it was somewhat more flawed data than the very careful data that had been taken before. Um, so I think we'll survive th that and maybe and thrive. Good question, yeah. Yeah. But I wonder, is it possible that for some reasonable range of dollar value, the optimal strategy will not change? Um, so you shouldn't be so deterred from. Well, I think it'll. I think if you include dollars, it'll it'll always change. The 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 the, the first one that I abandoned trying to explain, uh, dollar dollar cost of lost successes. I guess it was. Um, you can see that as soon as the dollar ratio show gets off of one, it starts favoring one treatment over the other. Um, now, an interesting point is, as long as the effect is just to move the green line, it it it, it actually hardly matters how you how you explain it. In other words, in other words, maybe maybe the way I say it is, I was trying to avoid a strategy that explicitly raised the green line. And instead, I had a strategy that explicitly, I found a strategy that I considered ethical that explicitly moved it to the left. Well, I hate to say this about a diagonal line. <laughs> okay, so, so it turns out all we're really debating is how much we want to move it depending on the cost ratio. And, and then, for policy reasons, reasons, how we want to formulate why we're willing to do that. So you know, again, a, a good a good question, and I, I don't think I've completely understood uh, what are all the possibilities of including cost. Do you mind yeah. Displaying that graphic again. Just Which one? The marginal effect. There. The, this one with so with. Uh, on yeah, yeah. So. Um, Yeah, but but that's not what I that that's what came out of the calculation. That's not what I actually did. What I actually did was put in a cost function that explicitly has. I put my pointer away. I know many of you have to be at a, another class at one thirty. Um, I put it. I put in something that explicitly has the cost of each treatment in it. O okay and. And you know, maybe somebody else would have been smart enough to say, oh, you're just going to move that green line. But it wasn't obvious to me, you know, as I make this cost ratio extreme, say a factor of 10, maybe the line doesn't become a line at all. Maybe it becomes some weird squiggly curve or something. Or maybe the regions break up into a speckled pattern again instead of big regions. That, that, uh, it wasn't obvious to me what the effect of putting this cost in. 
it was sort of remarkable to me that the effect ended up being just to shift the line and not even to change its slope, to actually just shift it by constant to good, to good numerical approximation, you know, to, to sort of 1% numerical approximation. Um, so, yeah, I think there are a lot of interesting questions as to, because, I'm, because as I say, I'm an experimenter, a numerical experimenter here, as to, um, is this a general, f is it a general feature of these banded models that, that, that cost can't enter as generally as you might imagine, but, but, but only affects them in, certain, in a certain restricted way? I, to me, that's a bit mysterious. Yeah, last question. It's not really a question, but that could be a really costly uh, approach. So, so if you, if you your, your initial example was, well, pharmaceutical companies come in with me two drugs that aren't really any better or yeah. moderately better. But it could be that you could come in with a radical new treatment that is radically more expensive than whatever, the, more, both more expensive yeah. and, and more effective. And then you'd essentially be designing a really expensive clinical trial. Because you'd be assigning many more people to the more effect. I mean, to, well, well, what, that, what, that, what would that do? So here, here's a cost ratio of 10. And you can see, as I say, this line moves over only logarithmically. So, so uh, you know, a cost ratio of 100 would only move it over a little bit more. And what does that say? That, that says that, um, it, it, and we started out at zero, right, with t value on the difference. And it wouldn't say we assign no one to the expensive treatment. On the contrary, it would say we continue to assign most patients um, um, to the known good treatment or known, no, actually it's just known cheaper treatment if we're at zero. Um, but when the imbalance gets to be whatever this, co whatever this ratio is, then we assign a patient to the expensive one. And then that patient on the expensive one will either succeed or fail, and that will move us either to the left or right. And so this really will asymptotically find the superior drug. Um, not more quickly in number of patients, more quickly costed by the dollar cost of failures. Okay, because that's how we set the problem. This is the optimal way of finding the best drug by the cost metric assigned, which, which here was dollar cost of lost failures. Okay, thank you very much.